This chapter will walk you through executing code and writing scripts in R. You will then build upon that knowledge by learning about comments, variables, operators, functions, loops, conditionals, and libraries. While this chapter is called Programming Basics, the knowledge you'll have learned by the end of this chapter is enough for you to accomplish a huge variety of tasks. When working in most programming languages, you will generally have the option to execute code in one of two ways, either in the console or in a script. If you're working in RStudio, you'll access the console through the console pane which is that bottom left pane. For example, we can type print three plus two, press enter and see the result. We get five as expected, but you may be wondering what this one is. This is simply a line number in the console and can be ignored for most practical purposes. You will likely be using scripts most of the time when working in R. A script is just a file that allows you to type out longer sequences of code and execute them all at once. For those of you following along in RStudio, you can create a new script by pressing Control shift n on Windows or Command shift n on Mac, or by selecting R script from the new file dropdown in the top left corner, as we went over earlier. From here, you can type the same command from before into the source pane. Next, you'll want to save your file by pressing Control S on Windows or by selecting Save from the File dropdown in the top left corner. Now, just give your file a name and your file will automatically be saved as a .r file. Finally, run your newly created R script by pressing the Source button and you should get the same output in your console pane. Comments are present in most, if not all, programming languages. They allow the user to write text in their code that isn't executed or read by computers. Comments can serve many purposes, such as notes, instructions, or formatting. Comments are created in R by using the pound or hashtag symbol. Let's do an example. If we do print three plus two, like we've been doing before, and then highlight everything by selecting control A and then executing by control enter. We can see that the code executes as it has been. Now, if we want to create a comment, we can do the pound symbol and then type, this is a comment. Again, we'll select everything with control A and execute with control enter. And we'll see that while the console did read out the comment, it didn't do anything to the actual execution of the code. Some programming languages allow you a bulk comment feature, which allows you to quickly comment out multiple consecutive lines of text. However, in R, there's no such, such option. Each line must begin with the pound symbol. This looks like this. This is a second comment. Can select all and execute again and see the code still functions the same. Comments don't have to start at the beginning of a line though. You're also able to start comments anywhere in a line. So if we do one right after our print statement, this is a third comment. We can select all, execute once again, and it didn't affect our output. Variables are used in programming to give values to a symbol. Let's create a new example and create a variable named rate and give it a value of 15. Let's create another variable named hours and give it a value of four. Finally, let's create a variable called total cost and give it a value equal to rate times hours. And then let's print out the value of total cost. So we'll select everything with control A and then execute with control enter. And we can see that the value of total cost was equal to 60, which makes sense, which was 15 times four. 
The next principle is operators, which are symbols that allow you to perform an action or define some sort of logic. The main categories of operators are arithmetic, comparison, logical, and assignment, although there are other operators that fall out of those categories. Arithmetic operators allow users to perform basic mathematical operations. Most of the examples are pretty straightforward, so we'll go through them fast. For example, if we did three plus three, we get six as we'd expect. We could also do three minus three, or we could do three times three. Oops. We could also do three to the power of three. Or three divided by three. Uh, the last couple of operators might be a little trickier. The first one is the modulus operator, which can be noted with two percent signs. So three modulus three gives us zero, but if we did 10 mod seven, we would get three. So the modulus operator will return the remainder of a division operation. And then the other thing we can do is put a slash in between and we'll get a one. So this is integer or Euclidean division, which will return the result of a division operation without the fractional component. The next category of operators is comparison operators, which allow users to compare values. So we could start out by saying three is equal to three and then check to see if that's true or false. If we run that, it'll say true as expected. The next one we can do is we could say three is not equal to three and then check the truthfulness of that and we get false. We can also do greater than, which three is not greater than three, or we could do less than, and we get false. We could also check to see if three is greater than or equal to three, and we should get true. And then we can check to see if it's less than or equal to three, and we should also get true. All right, now we're gonna go over logical operators, which allow users to express and, or, and not statements. The following examples will demonstrate how these operators might be used in conjunction with the comparison operators we just reviewed, as well as the difference between standard logical operators and what's called vectorized logical operators. So let's start with the standard operator. We're gonna begin with and. So this example will return a single true only if both conditions are met, Otherwise, false will be returned. So first, we're going to evaluate whether or not 3 is greater than or equal to 0, and then whether or not negative 3 is less than or equal to 0. So we're going to run this, and we get true because 3 is greater than 0 and negative 3 is less than or equal to 0. So let's see if we can't make this false. So if we do negative 1 is greater than or equal to 0, and negative three is less than or equal to zero. We'll run that and we'll get a false. So even though this second statement is true, we're evaluating whether both are true, so we get a false. Next, we have a little bit of a trickier concept, which is a vectorized AND operator. So instead of evaluating just one value, we're gonna evaluate a vector. So right here, we have negative three through three. And what that does is it creates a data set that looks like this called a vector, which is the values of negative three all the way up through three. So it's evaluating seven numbers against this condition. And then it's doing the same thing. It's going to evaluate to see if both sides of the condition are true. 
So in our case, instead of getting one true or false, we should get seven true or falses. So let's run this and see, we get false, 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 true, false, false, false. So what's going on here is we're checking to see if the vector is greater than or equal to zero and whether or not it's less than or equal to zero. So the only thing that makes sense that would be true is that zero is both greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to zero, which is why we get the one true value in the middle. So we can do a couple of other things with these logical operators. So let me copy this example over. So this would be a standard and operator, except we're putting this exclamation point before the second one to negate the value. So let's run that and see what we get. So we get false. And if we get rid of that negation, we get true. Um, another thing we can do is instead of and, so we can do or. So this is a vectorized or operator. So we get all trues this time. And that's just saying, saying if any of these sides contains an element that matches the, the operation, then return true rather than both needing to be true. And then like the and operators, we can do a standard or operator as opposed to the vectorized. And then the key thing here, um, the syntax is mostly the same between standard and vector, but you'll notice uh, you're adding a symbol on one. Next, we have assignment operators, which we've kind of already covered. Assignment operators allow users to assign values to something. For most users, uh, using either this or this operator is all you'll ever need to do. Let's try these out. So let's say rate is 15 and then print rate. Simple. The alternative is we could say 15 is rate and then print rate. Let's just select this portion, see what we get. Same thing. So all you're, we're really doing there is flipping the symbol around. Nothing too crazy. So for the most part, this is all you'll ever need, but there is a more advanced concept of local versus global variables. For global variables, the book has an example of how those might function, but it's not super important to learn right now. And for the most part, you can do what you need to do without ever needing to encounter them. But feel free to reference the book if you're in a situation where they might be helpful. All right, and then there are a couple of miscellaneous operators that we'll cover real quickly. The first is this percent %n percent operator, which just checks to see if three exists in a vector of one through three. And then obviously we have this colon operator, which we've already been using in examples. Uh, it allows you to create a series of numbers in a secret sequence. And then finally, I guess this one might be considered an arithmetic operator. Um, but this percent asterisk percent operator allows you to do matrix multiplication. So we create a matrix and assign it to X. And then we say X matrix multiplied by X. And yeah, our next concept is functions. Functions allow you to bundle a predefined set of operations into one command. And let's go over a couple of examples. All right, so in this example, we're creating a function named function name. And then inside the function name, we're saying print the text, hello world. And then in order to execute the function, we're gonna do that down here. So if we just run this part, We'll, we'll see that nothing actually happens. We, we get a function that's created and it exists, but hasn't been called yet. 
in order to call it, we'll run this line and we'll see it prints out hello world. So this can be useful for storing procedures and not having to, to duplicate code um, and maybe just even organizing your code base. We can take this one step further. Let's get rid of this by creating arguments. Um, arguments allow you to pass information into the function when it's called. Here is an example. So you see now, instead of having nothing in between, we have two arguments, X and Y. So we tell the function that these arguments exist. And when it receives these arguments, print the sum of X and Y. And then when we call it down here, instead of saying X and Y, we pass in the actual values. So we're creating a function called add numbers. And then when we call it, we say add numbers two and three. And it prints out five. Um, and then the last concept of functions um, is returning values. So um, in the last two examples, we were just printing out values to the console. Alternatively, we can say, let's create a function called calculate raise, give it two arguments, base salary and annual adjustment. And then inside the function, we'll say raise is equal to base salary times annual adjustment. And then instead of printing raise out, we'll say return raise this time. And what that does is it lets us store the values in other variables. So let's go ahead, create this function. And then here we can say, we wanna calculate John's raise. And let's say his base salary is 90,000 and his annual adjustment is 5%. So we'll run that. Um, we'll see over here in the environment, it gives us the value, but we can also say print John's raise. Um, and then we can do Jane's raise and say she makes 100,000 and her annual adjustment is 4.5%. Um, and we can see that's calculated over here as well. Next, we're going to cover loops. There are two types of loops in R, while loops and for loops. So let's start with while loops. So in this example, we create a variable named I, set it equal to one. And then we say, while I is less than or equal to three, print I. And then after it prints I, we're gonna say, I is equal to itself plus one. So let's run this and see what happens. So the value of I started at one, it went into the while loop, printed its value. So we have one, it added one to itself, printed the value two, added one to itself again, printed the value three. And then since we said only do this while I is less than or equal to three, the while loop stopped. Um, another thing we can do with while loops is we can add break statements. So let's run this and see what happens. Okay, so what do we do here? We took, we created a variable named i, set it equal to one, and then we said, while i is less than or equal to 10, print i like we did in the last one, um, but we created this extra statement in here and said, if i is equal to five, then print stopping halfway and then break. So, um, instead of continuing on after five, it breaks itself and stops the loop. Um, obviously this example doesn't seem very practical, but putting in those break statements can help you to catch certain conditions and stop loops when you don't want them to continue. All right. The next type of loop is a for loop. So let's get an example here. Okay. We've got John and Jane again. Um, let's execute this and see what happens. Okay, so it looks like it printed out each employee name. Let's see what happened here. So we said there's a variable named employees 
and that is equal to a list that contains Jane and John. So let's print out employees and just see what that looks like. Okay, so it looks like it is just a variable that contains these two values. And then we said for employee in employees, print employee. So for every value in that list, print out the name of that employee. All right, the next concept is conditionals, which is going to allow us to execute a command if a condition is met by using if statements, which we kind of did in that last, last loop section, if you're paying attention. All right, so let's copy over our example. All right, so it says if two is greater than zero, print true. So let's run this. Looks like it worked. Um, let's say if zero is greater than zero, print true. Looks like the function decided to do nothing because the conditional wasn't met. Um, we can also add more conditions by adding else if statements. So let's copy over another example. So what's going on here? We say if two is greater than three, print two is greater than three. Else, so if that's not true if two is less than three print two is not greater than three so let's run this and see what happens it looks like that first condition wasn't hit so it came down and evaluated the second condition and that was true so it executed the code that was inside there um, the last concept here is we can catch anything that doesn't meet any of the conditions by just adding an else statement instead of an else if so here's an example. So we have a variable and we set it equal to 20. We say if X is less than 20, then print out that statement. Else if X is greater than 20, print out that statement. And then instead of having an else if, we just have an else. So we say if none, none of the above conditions are met, then print this final statement out. So let's run it and see what happens. And it looks like it caught in that last else statement. All right, let's get rid of this. Get rid of this. Our last concept in the programming basics is our packages. So packages allow you to access functions that other people have created uh, and share them out in a standard format. Uh, there's a few ways. The main way, though, is to use what's called the comprehensive R archive network or CRAN is abbreviation. Um, but there's a couple other options like Bioconductor, R Universe, or even just GitHub repositories. So in order to first access a package's functionality, you first have to add it to your systems library. Afterward, you can check it out for use uh, with a command called the library command, and we'll go over all this. So let's go through an example. One of uh, a really popular package is called dplyr. So let's install this package first so we can access it. And we'll get some feedback here in the console. And looks like it downloaded successfully. So after we've installed a package, we can make it available in our R session with the library command. So now that package is available and all the functions that exist inside of there uh, are available to be used. Um, so if we type dplyr colon colon, it'll kind of give us a list of functions that are available uh, as well as some like quick documentation, but we're not gonna go through that now. Um, another common way to install packages that might not be uh, on CRAN uh, but maybe they're on GitHub, is to install a package called remote. So let's install that. And then uh, packages that people have created and hosted on their personal GitHub accounts, you can have access to. So we'll say remote colon colon, and then use the function from the remote package that we just installed, install GitHub. Or I guess we should include it in our in our environment first. Um, but yeah, we'll use that function. 
And then I have a package on my GitHub um, called Trevor. Um, so you'll specify the user or the user's name slash the repository, and then it'll install that package directly from that user's GitHub. 